Are you conversational at all, or? Oh, you know, my conversational kind of goes and come as I, as when I'm there. Ah, uh, okay. All right. When I'm there, it gets much better, obviously. Yeah. Um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but so you're, you're you're currently teaching at Northern Arizona. Uh, your last two books were Boom Plus Boom and Red Summer, and you also directed Miss Sarajevo and Fools Rush In. Yeah. That's right. Um, and that you have a long. The, 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 the book Fools Rush In is, is a book, uh, and the Miss Syria was a documentary. Okay, I have both of those in the box somewhere in, in Croatia. I read them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, our, our class here it's called European Politics, um, and it's made up of international and local uh, students in Mexico. And we talked about the war in Yugoslavia some weeks ago, and we wanted to to hear. Um, more from you. I was actually living in Croatia in 1994 at the tail end of the war, but I was 10 years old and we didn't, our, our immediate family didn't see direct experience. So um, I guess just to start, so, um, I gave them a pro-Serbian and a pro-Croatian uh, perspective. And myself being a Croatian, um, it's still kind of confusing for me, you know? And I sure. just I, I wanted to hear perhaps what what was your perception of the war? What 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 do you think were the causes? And, and what what do you think of the actors involved being an American and, and your experience there? Wow, that's a that's a loaded question right now. That's, I mean, if you know the region, if, uh, not you personally, but it, your students. But if you know the Balkans, it's um his question is a loaded question. It, there's a there's a great deal of controversy as to how you define the players, how you define the war, how you define everything. It, it creates a um, tension. But I'm going to give you my best shot, okay? Okay, hang on. So, and part of it comes from, you know, my own experience. Um, when I first went into the war, I went in through Croatia. Um, the humanitarian operation for Bosnia was based primarily in split Croatia, a uh, beautiful town on the Adriatic. And to be quite honest with you, my experience in Croatia during the war was a little bit um, um, not so good. <laughs> uh, um, Part of it was because they're burned out from the war. They already had themselves with the Serbians. Um, part of it was, to be quite honest, the Croatians were not that interested in helping the Bosnians. Um, they are much more engaged with vis-a-vis -vis the Serbians. Bosnia was kind of a, I wouldn't call it a distraction for them, but it wasn't really what they were um, involved in. Um, the, I'm going to tell you really honestly, when you drive from Croatia to Bosnia, or Croatia to Sarajevo, I believe it's around 150 kilometers um, from like a town, Mekovic. If you take that drive, during the war, let's say Bosnia is like the size of this right here. <laughs> okay, this third of it is called Herzegovina, which means basically a Croatian-influenced side culturally and, and everything, uh, part of Bosnia. It's very Croatian. That particular area, Herzegovina, was in some ways the most dangerous area of, for me, of all of Bosnia. Um, it was a little bit of the, um, in the worst kind of way, a little bit of the Wild West. You might have heard from your professor towns like Mostar, um, uh, Zenica, Prozar. I, I don't know, but they were very um, Gornovakuf. Those were very, very volatile regions, and you really had no idea 
who to hurt you. It could be HBO, which is Croatian Bosnian Army. It could be the Serbian Army. It could be the Bosnian Irregulars. You don't know. I mean, it was a crazy little zone. Um, once you got through that zone, and you actually approached the the Serb checkpoint of Sarajevo, then it all changed. Um, Yes, you were very frightened of the Serbian checkpoints, no doubt about it. But then something kind of weird happens for me, for most internationals. When you go through the checkpoint that surrounded Sarajevo, Sarajevo was totally surrounded, um, they take about 40% of your load. That was their price of humanitarian aid going into Sarajevo, was to take about 40% of the load which then would arrive on the black market inside Bosnia within a couple days. Um, once they took the load and you arrived in Sarajevo, you're being shot at pretty much the whole way. But once you arrived in the city, it was very, I never, ever, ever feared for my life from another person in the city. Um, I didn't. I can't tell you that of anywhere else in Bosnia, but I really felt like in the city of Sarajevo, whether you're a Croatian, Serbian, uh, Roma, just, uh, whatever you were, a Bosnian Muslim, they got they found a way to get along. And so I was never scared of the person in front of me. The, you know, the guys shooting from the hills, were, you know, they'll kill anybody. So you were. It was didn't matter if you were a Mexican American. Serbian creation. When you were in Sarajevo, you were a possible suspect of being, you know, killed. So that was that's that's the dynamics of the place. Um, in terms of who's at fault, oh boy, you know, you could uh, you could teach that course until you're, uh, yeah, you know, old age. Um, I mean, and, and you, one, yeah, go ahead. One thing that I mean, just put it out there was that I was raised uh, by my parents very. Croatian nationalist and Tujman, right, was like Superman. Right. And it took me a while to snap out of it because Tujman and Milosevic were both vying for a greater Croatia and greater Serbia. And right. nobody's innocent here. And so, you know, it's right. hard to point I, too many fingers. The, the only people that will say we're innocent are the people that are living in places like Sarajevo, Garajde, Zepa, Srebrenica, the places that were surrounded by uh, these occupying forces and then decimated, starved, uh, shelled, snipered, they really, they were innocent. Um, but the, what you're talking about is the power play. And Tujman was an incredible, as you know, a nationalist. Uh, Milosevic, I personally, personally don't believe him to be an, as much a nationalist as, a, as an opportunist. Um, he, you know, he, he, he wanted power, he wanted land, he wanted, he basically wanted to get to the coast. Um, uh, Tujman, I think, was more of a nationalist, like, in the head. Um, there's other Serbians who are extreme nationalists, but I think Milosevic just was, saw an opportunity and took it. Um, so, and, and the Bosnians had their own nationalist people who were freaks. Uh, uh, so they all were. They all had that, but I would say that the here's the here's the real. You break it down in an incredibly simplistic way, which is always dangerous. The Croatians have the coast, and they have a certain source of, uh, and you know, institutions in place. And then you have the Serbians, who you basically represented ex Yugoslavia. Basically, what you had between Tuđman and Milosevic was a power grab. The problem with these two entities, these two uh, countries, is the thing that's in between them, and that is Bosnia. And they basically, around 1993, decided to go at each other, they stopped fighting, and they decided to piece, piecemeal Bosnia apart. And this is where Bosnia started to disintegrate, is they were being torn apart by both sides. Um, and that was the... Uh, the real crime, I guess. Okay, so we got that out of the way. What, uh, <laughs> what, what were, I guess, some experiences, big experiences, good or bad, that remain with you most, I guess, life-changing or, 
or whatnot. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 but. Uh, have you, have you, is your class, okay, let me ask you this. Don't answer this question, Professor. Someone in the class answered this question. Have you seen Miss Sarajevo in that class? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, a number of them have seen Miss Sarajevo. Okay. Well, if you saw Miss Sarajevo, I mean, life change, when you're in, a, I was in that war for almost two years. Um, and I lived on the seventh floor of a burned out building. And I didn't have any uh, um, lifelines, if you want to call it that. Uh, you're going to have a lot of life-changing experiences. Um, they can range. You know, the really weird thing is they range. They range from uh, uh, seeing people die in front of you, uh, seeing children have their heads blown off, uh, to then on a peaceful day, nothing's happening. You're... Um, listening to like a friend's story. Somebody you've been hanging out with for a year. You've been sharing things and maybe playing soccer or football or whatever. And suddenly they tell you about how, you know, three months ago, a shell went into their grandpa's house and killed everybody in the family but him and his brother. I mean, that kind of stuff just tears you apart. The thing that really haunts you, I think, the most when you come home is not those things. Because that's the evil of men, and, and we kind of know that about each other. The part that really, it doesn't crush me in a, in a bad way, it crushes me in an overwhelming emotional way, is the absolute goodness of people. And when it happens, it, it's utterly overwhelming. What do I mean by that? I go to your home, you are starving. Your daughters are starving, but you have your last can of tuna, and you decide to share it with me, or your last spring onion. That like that gift, that uh, that ability to then to give their last thing is, oh, it um, it gives me great hope. <laughs> so I, I, it's the most amazing thing, but it also kind of. It's overwhelmingly emotional to see that and inspiring at the same time. The bad of people is always worse than you think. <laughs> and, um, and by the way, if you're – Mexico has its, <laughs> has, uh, its own version of this that we've been experiencing for about a decade. Um, I mean, so, just, just last week, uh, an hour down the road – uh, drug cartels ambushed and brutally murdered 15 elite, yeah. the new elite special forces. So, yeah, <laughs> we're in the no, middle. I mean, no, I mean, look at the big case that you all know about, especially the students, is the students who were all killed and um, the 43 students. I mean, you know, Mexico's got like a, its own uh, nightmare going on. Um, so it's everywhere. I mean, this kind of evil does exist, unfortunately, when it, um, and it's, it's, it's hard to see up close. Okay. And do you, do you go? Do you ever go back to Bosnia? I do. You know, um, I've been back several times um, for different reasons. Um, sometimes just to see my friends. Uh, I went. The, here's the funny thing: when the war ended, I um, I left. I was there for the end of the war. I was making a documentary on a reporter, and uh, and NATO jets bombed the city. It was as absolutely just mind-boggling. And I went back two years later when I helped to put on the U2 concert in Sarajevo. And it was very strange because I had deeply memorized that city as if almost I was a blind person because there's no electricity. So I could walk that city at dark. I could walk through the tunnels of the back pass, up that person's stairway, across there, down through that garden. You know, I knew this city through the back channels that had been made for the war. And two years later, they were all gone. And I had no idea how to get around the city. I totally had no – I'd never walked that city in a normal, like, way. Like, you know, you take that street, then you go to that street – and also more more weird was that all of my, my friends, all of our contact was interpersonal, meaning I see you, you come to my where I, 
I'm living at the time, or I go to work, I know you are at that time of day. There were no phones in the war. So suddenly I got out there in 1987 and I didn't have anybody's phone number. And I didn't have any idea how to contact people. And it was very weird for me to uh, kind of recalibrate my brain to a more modern time. And I've been back since when I got honorary citizenship and, and, and various other occasions. So, so no Facebook and Twitter to keep in touch. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We keep in touch that. Juan, Juan, you had a question? Yeah. We have a Colombian here. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I went into your blog the buildcarter.cc and saw some of, of the photos uh, th that are online and my question for you is being an accomplished author, filmmaker and humanitarian how do you perceive the potential of photography and video for storytelling purposes? Because yeah. for example, well, um, uh, I, yeah. I saw this picture that I really like. Oh yes, okay yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, that photograph, just a little history of that photograph, it was taken in the town of Mostar, uh, which is in that Herzegovina part of what I was talking about. Um, it's a beautiful city. And, you know, I mean, how does filmmaking and photography play into storytelling? It's funny, I just got out of a class that I teach that. <laughs> um, I... <laughs> To me, that's how I tell stories, right? I mean, I also write, but photography and filmmaking are the ultimate, you know, I, it's the easiest way for audiences, especially modern audiences, to come to go through the story. The trick of it is to tell a story in a compelling way. And not everybody can do that, and that's okay. And I believe it takes time. It takes a lot of time. I, I, let's pretend that, Juan, you hired me, okay, and you say, hey, come to Mexico. I'm going to give you one week in Mexico to, to, get, to capture something that tells our story. Um, I might get a few photos that are good, but honestly, most likely I'd fail. Uh, there's a reason that National Geographic sends people for like two months to get photographs. Um, you know, the modern world is going very quick with computers and social media, but to truly get the essence of a story, whether it's on film, in writing, or photography, I believe you have to get there, immerse yourself, hear the rhythm of people, hear the, what's go, how do people interact, what's going on. Um, that's how I operate, that's how I can get stories. Um, and it's to me, the most compelling thing is photography, actually all three, writing and photography. I have, for instance, the photograph you just put up. When I have galleries uh, showings of it, I have a whole story that goes with it. And it's like a short story. And people like the short, short story almost more than the photograph. But then the photograph comes alive because of the story. Um, so they're, to me, they're intertwined. And um, I'm addicted to it. I don't mean, I don't mean like it, I'm not addicted to violence or war by any means. I'm addicted to human beings and their stories. I absolutely just love stories. I could sit down with each of you and talk to you like for a day each because I'd be fascinated by each of your stories. And you might think your own story is boring, but I don't. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's just that uh, I also like photography a lot and I found that a, it's a way of, of picturing the moment and it also can be a lie because, for example, the, I think the name of the photograph is, is hide, hide and Seek. You know, right. like, like the children was playing, like she was playing right in the middle of a wall that had uh, bullet holes. You know, so it's like joy and happiness in the midst of violence and, or, and war. So it's, it has a, uh, an element of, of, of truth and lie. But uh, that's, why, that, that, that's why the reason of, of my question for you. Thank you. That's a really good point, Juan, is that, like, hide-and-seek, you know, if you watch Miss Cerebral, there's a lot of um, clashing of uh, very violent 
uh, situation with a very uh, surreal celebration of art and life. And that's kind of what I'm, I love that clash. And it's like hide and seek is that. The kids, they don't stop playing. And oddly enough, they kind of play, they play war, which is like totally bizarre. Um, and uh, so hide and seek was, is, is kind of that idea. And you, you kind of nailed it. Um, in terms of how, if you want to like, this very interesting, some people take photography and they um, do street photography or they do documentary photography or they do uh, very different kinds. I'm kind of a combo between the two. I like to be someplace, be quietly watching. Uh, maybe they know who I am. They've seen me around the town. They see the camera. They, I don't take pictures. I just, I'm there. I'm not a journalist. And that, that will get in, get out. Uh, I, I, I'm there for a while. And then I start taking photographs. And they kind of tend to not forget about me, but leave me alone while I do it. And that's always worked for me, you know. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And related to that, we watched an excerpt of an interview you did on was called Mojo Con. I think. Yeah, it was last, two weeks ago in Dublin. Uh, two weeks, and um, they asked you some good questions, and one of them was the use of, um, I guess, technology. And you were talking about how sometimes you have to go old school. Technology doesn't solve everything. Um, but so then my question on top of that is regarding the places where we can use this uh, new technology of social networks and like Skype that we're doing, um, blogs and, and YouTube. Um, what are some things young and passionate people, well, like Juan and um, some of our future humanitarians, I hope, uh, what are some things that they can and, and should be doing with this new technology? And you see them maybe not using it in, in a good way because it's a powerful tool and in the ways where it can work, not the old school ways, that, as you described. I mean, what are some ways that they can take advantage? Oh, man, I tell you what. I, this, I, this conference in Dublin, Ireland, was mind-blowing. I, I can take this iPhone 6 and download an app called Film Inc., Filmic, create this. This becomes much more than of a movie camera, and then all of a sudden you're doing cinematic storytelling with this phone and you can totally put it on the air and you can totally make a movie out of it. That is amazing. Um, and that should be used. And what, what I think the danger of, uh, this is what I was trying to get at in that interview. Let's take my example in Bosnia. Because there was no technology and I had a very limited package of camera and, and everything, I was forced to um, interact with locals. I was forced to be very resourceful. I had to figure out how to charge batteries, how to feed myself, how to do all these things. And it made me get very, very, very close and interactive with people. Um, the, social, the, the new technologies, I'm afraid that it has a way of having everybody looking down. <laughs> um, and not having, not forcing themselves to have intimate interactions with people, strangers, whatever, getting out there in the world. And that's the only thing that really makes me a little bit scared, is that thinking technology will solve our entire problem. When I think it has a little bit of a danger to inhibit the story, because sometimes the story comes about by getting uncomfortably involved. Um, that's all I was trying to get at. The actual tools of this technology should be totally taken advantage of, whether it's social media, especially for like humanitarian causes. That's a real big boom to humanitarian causes is social media. Um, whether it's using this phone, like I'm, I'm in talks right now with some people in Turkey out of Europe to go to Turkey maybe to train Syrian journalists using this to then go make films very discreetly in Syria, because right now Syria is a black hole. There's no information coming out of Syria. And I can't go there because I'll be killed within, you know, an hour. So um, it's, a, it's really like the world's only, like you don't know what's going on there, like North Korea maybe. Um, but North Korea, that's different. Syria, we need to know what's going on. 
this is very important world geopolitics going on in Syria. So th that's a way that this phone, this technology, is very revolutionary um, and, and, and should be totally embraced. Um, but don't forget to look up. <laughs> that's my biggest fear. Because I know that I can see out there there's someone right over there that's been on the computer this whole time. And uh, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm trying to say it's very much today's world. And um, that's all I'm trying to say about the technology. I don't want us to – it should serve us in our storytelling. It shouldn't replace mm -hmm. actual storytelling. And we do have to roll up our sleeves and get our hands uh, dirty. Yeah, you do. So hi, Mr. Carter. This is Lorenza. And Hello. I wanted to know, what was your inspiration while you were eating at Sarajevo? What was that that kept you going despite the situation of war? I had traveled the world before I went to Sarajevo as a traveler, like a backpacker. And, and I, I just fell in love with the world, right? I've always been a traveler. I love traveling. It's the most rewarding thing I've done in my life. And when the war broke out, I also had a, a tragic thing that happened in my life. I lost my fiance in a tragic car accident. The, the problem was is that um, if any of you have been in this situation, is that, that um, when you love someone and they, they die, you're in a very lonely place they're gone, but your love for them is not gone. And so what do you do with it? It becomes an extreme, almost becomes like a nuclear reactor inside of you. And it, 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 it eats you alive because you can't do anything with it. And um, for me, by the way, this is all self-reflective. This is not, when I was that age, I wasn't sitting there having some sort of, you know, intelligent conversation in my head about this. Um, but I can tell you that that's how I was feeling. And I found, I just, you know what, I, I was on the side of the road at three o'clock in the morning and in Croatia, wanting to go to this place to help. I just wanted to help. I was going to spend every last amount of my body and energy. If it meant dying, that was fine to help. Because it was the way that was going to burn off this energy, if that makes any sense. Um, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have any connections. I didn't have anything other than I'm going to do everything I can. And and then it got a little crazy, <laughs> um, you know, with meeting you two, and and suddenly I had. I could Bosnians. I got them on the much bigger voice, and we did satellite link-ups, and I'm making a movie, and I'm in Ireland, I'm on private jets, and I'm like, what in the hell is going on? Um, but I never lost. I think the reason that I got these people, whether they were in private jets or on the street of Sarajevo, was I never lost why I was there. I never. You didn't see me suddenly saying. Oh man, you know, um, I I want your money, or I'm cool, or whatever. I just was driven. I was so driven that, to be honest with you, people parted for me. They did. They just, oh, this guy's gonna do this, so he's gonna do it. So I guess that's what we're doing. <laughs> and um, it was almost like I was under a spell, you know. And when that broke, when the spell broke. After the war, then I was in trouble, and I was in, I was in a lot of trouble because one, I had the problem I had before I went to the war was still there. <laughs> I didn't think that would happen, but it was still there. And two, I had on top of that a lot of post traumatic stress. Put those two things together, I was a disaster. Thank you. But you just dropped a nuclear bomb on us. <laughs> you, you, you put it so well. Thank you um, very much. Yeah. Any final questions for Mr. Carter? Come on up. Last last call. Um, and I guess I had a question going bringing us up to date. What was your perspective on 
Croatia, you know, they were the last to join the EU, the 28th country now. Um, it seems Serbia is stuck between Russia and EU. Right. And Bosnia, Bosnia is on the EU waiting list. And so what are your hopes, dreams, forecasts? I mean, what do you think uh, in the near future, what does it look like? You know, I, I mean, it's considering you're a Croatian heritage. Yeah. I think Croatia, first of all, Croatia is always going to be fine. Because it has a way to, um, it has much more a pipeline to Europe, and it has a has the coast, and people love going to the coast. So it has an economic engine that doesn't rely. It's it, it's got its own engine. It's also got very good wine. Um, but uh, is is the, I, the Croatia I worry about because as you probably know from in the football experience, uh, Croatia was playing. I. Um, I can't remember who they were playing. They could have been playing Serbia. Uh, but I can't remember, but they were playing a game this last fall, and he started singing a uh, – uh, this is kind of old history for your kids, but um, he started singing basically an Ustasha song, basically okay, yeah. like a Nazi song. Yeah. And you can explain that to your kids later. But um, So ba you had 70,000 people singing this song. He was kicked out of soccer. And so this is like – this is the thing I worry about with Croatia. It has that – it hides in Croatia in a very um, dangerous way. Um, Bosnians, they're fine. They, they just need to be able to make money. They're kind of like uh, – they have very corrupt politicians. Um, so they're kind of imploding from like a top-heavy politicians, and no one's – you elect a mayor, and you think, what does a mayor do? Well, you know what a mayor does when the garbage gets really high on the streets. Uh, you know, a new water doesn't work, and Bosnia is kind of in a weird uh, place of it's not functioning so great. Uh, and Serbia, I did like you say, they're a little bit confused. I think they want to rejoin the world, but um, they have some old. Um, they have a real. Um, I personally, okay, not Serbian people. I know there's. I know a lot of Serbians that are great. They live in Belgrade, no problem. But the Serbian culture has kind of a slight persecution complex that. Um, it it, 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 it kind of creates blinders for some of them, and um, I, they have that more. I don't think Croatia has that nearly as much. They're just proud, <laughs> uh, and, and the Bosnians don't really have it. They're too desperate to like figure out how to go to the market. Uh, so, anyways, I, I don't think they're going to go to war. I don't think there's any danger of that. I think they're exhausted by uh, the last one, um, and there's enough good forces in all those countries that does not that, that do not want that. And you have a generation, especially in Bosnia, of people who are um, like your age, the, your students' age, who went through, the, who lived through the war. They don't want a piece of any of that. They don't want anything to do with that. Um, they're they're done. They lost their childhood. Um, so I think it's a recovering region. <laughs> and, and going back to that, the comment you made about that. Now come on up. Uh, about the Ustasha, and maybe some of my friends will hear this online back in the States, but uh, it's kind of sad because there's a lot of a number of Croatian Americans that I know, and they don't even know the history of, of Ustasha and, and what it is, and they think it's just cool, you know, nationalists, and they put on the garb and, and sing the songs, and it's it's just sad. They don't know what, what, what they're doing. You know, it's really it's really interesting you're bringing this up. This is, this is absolutely absolutely fascinating because I write about it in Fool's Rush In how I was – did you read – anybody – you guys did not read that book, right? No, we didn't have enough time. Okay, let me just give you – it doesn't matter. It's, it's all this experience and blah, blah, blah. But in the end, I've made Miss Sarajevo. I'm doing a big – I was asked to do a benefit in Los Angeles with um, uh, for the children of the war. Now the war was still on, or you know, very much fresh. So it was all ch all children. That was the agreement: Serbian, Croatian, Bosnians, any child. The idea was we were going to help each ethnic group and kind of a show of support, right? Okay. There was a movie played, which, by the way, you might know, called Vukovar. I think I've uh, seen it. Yeah. Yeah, the town of Vukovar was decimated, uh, and. It, there's no uh, dispute, honestly, about what happened. The Serbs wiped it out. I mean, actually, uh, my, my uncle, he was one of the first. He's still alive today. He, he took us there after the war, and 
He was one of the first volunteers. He told us it was a few dozen uh, that held it for months against like a thousand serfs, and and uh, yeah. it was all shot out afterwards. Yeah, it was. It was totally. It was. It was bad, and. The movie was very much um, persecution complex of the Serbians blaming the Croatians. I'm not in that war. I was not that friendly with Croatian. The HB, HBO and HBO, I was very scared of. However, we know what happened in Vukovar. Now, I played Miss Sarajevo. After that, when the time came, we were all wearing our tuxedos, and the people were paying a lot of money to give money to children. I went up and I talked about, I tried to be very multi-ethnic and multi, you know, everybody's here for a good cause. After me was the director of Vukovar, and it was a very much a pro-Serbian group that brought him, one of them being a basketball player, a famous basketball player in the NBA. Uh, yes. And uh, I got up on the stage, and he absolutely just went after me. I was there alone, right? I didn't have a date. I didn't have a power play. I didn't have these people around me. He said, this is propaganda. This is not true. This never happened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Go down the whole list. I wasn't going to say anything because I thought, oh, I don't know what's going on. And, and then the director of the, of the thing kept and said, you need to say something. And I got up there and I thought, what am I going to say? I know what I'm going to say. I know what I'm going to say. I took a risk. And I said, I will bet you anything that you, you were not in the war because if you were in the war you wouldn't have made that movie and I asked him straight up were you in the war and he wasn't so my point is afterwards I had an older man come over to me a Serbian man tell me he's a businessman in Los Angeles lived in America for 30 years saying he's gonna sue me He's going to make me go bankrupt, which, by the way, I already was. So who cares? Um, and um, the thing is, I was with two Bosnian kids, like 20-year-olds, that had just got out of the war. And they were from Srebrenica, which, if you know the story of Srebrenica, is not good. Uh, anyway, they said something to him in Bosnia. And what they said to him was, one of the kids had sunglasses on, right? Right. Well, I already knew this because I met them before the show, before that charity event. He was a Bosnian Serb who lived in Srebrenica, who didn't want to leave Srebrenica. And when the Serbs came and killed all the men, they took his eyes out. So he told the old man, basically, you don't know what you're talking about. He had his glasses and freaked the old guy out. Here's my point. I find X Pat to be the worst offenders of the nationalistic um, fire. You see it with like the Irish and the IRA. Yeah. The, all the money for the IRA came from America, Irish people who have been there 100 years and thought, oh, Ireland, we love Ireland. Um, the Americans do it when they're abroad. You know, uh, We all fall in love with our own country when we leave it. And there's no, there's no reason not to. I love, I love where I live and it's, it's okay, but it gets, you get a little bit, um, a strange thing can happen, and expats can be very removed from the history, like you just said. Ustasha was in World War II. The Croatians were firmly aligned with the Nazis, um, and by all historical count, up to a million people died in Croatia in camps that were run by either Croatians for the Nazis or the Nazis themselves, and they killed everybody. I mean, Jews, uh, Muslims. Um, whoever was not them. So, and if you, I don't know if you have this experience, but one of the first people I met in Herzegovina, which is the Croatian side of uh, Bosnia, in a town called Kisiak, I went into a store and a woman had, you see this only very rarely now, but I saw an old woman, she was working in the store, and she got on her forehead, she has a U. That U is something that you do that that means Ustasha, which for all for all practical purposes means Nazis. You know, it'd be like having a squash gun instead. So anyways it, it exists, that history exists. I don't think a lot of Christians hope not and uh, but it's out there and like you say expats should know it so that they have perspective.
of what's going on. And that's a great point because I teach that when I teach American politics or, or whichever is that we need to confront our histories, you know, that happened in the past, did happen. We don't have to hide it, you know. Um, that's not us now. Those people that were in charge did it, and so let's let's move on. Yeah, America, is it, are you kidding me? We're at, the, we're at the front of the class, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, um, for, you know, offensive history, we have plenty of it. Um, yeah. You know, when Obama says uh, – in, in relation to ISIS, he's not can, he's not saying ISIS is great. He's saying that Christianity has its own history of persecution, and we we need to understand that. And he's just trying to make a intellectual argument that these things can rise in the world. He's not justifying it, and he gets terrorized in America by the right wing about how he's supporting ISIS. And it's like, oh come on, go away. He's just having a intellectual conversation. Okay, and uh, you have a last question? We have a last question from a student. And, and the thing about the expats was was, was uh, also a great point there. Hello. Well, when I saw the documentary about Nisara Jevo, I was impressed about how, like, this event empowered uh, society and give them, like, something to believe on and to fight for. And seeing the, the crisis right now in, in Syria, from your experience and from your outlook of this crisis, what type of movement or event will you think it will give the same impact to the Syrian uh, society that might might uh, feel that they like might feel that their country will not be rebuilt again or that this crisis will never end? Like, what type of, of movement do you will you suggest from your experience? Thank you, man. That's a million dollar question right there, buddy. <laughs> um, and I wish I had a million dollar answer. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, to me, Syria, there's some similarities, right? Um, but there's a, the difference is, is that, uh, like I was telling you before, how when you got into Bosnia proper, you never felt scared of each other. I think in Syria... You're scared of one street's neighborhood to the next one, and sometimes, and the next one, and you don't quite, you can't ever leave. It's a very um, uh, polarized and complex place right now, and I think that that makes it very difficult to even try to imagine what inspiring experience they can create. Um, I bet it's happening. I'm just... My guess is it is happening, um, but possibly quietly, and it just in a way, not necessarily in a public way, just to kind of keep hope. It might be through the religion. It might be through um, because there's no other chance. No, what else are you going to do? Give up? I mean, you can't give up. Human beings have a really we're like cockroaches, man. We don't like to give up. Uh, so I don't know the answer to your thing, your question, which is a very good question. Um, I just hope that there's something going on inside that country that makes them believe the end will come. Do I think it's going to come? Not anytime soon. Um, you have too much complex. You have Assad, who's a nightmare. You have ISIS, which is a nightmare. And you have the people who are in the middle that don't have any way to face. Um, and you don't have anybody from the outside in there because, you know, the, they get killed. So, it was, you know, it's a very, um, it's overwhelming what's happening in Syria, you know. Maybe we can send them in to make a documentary. Oh, you got, he's got a follow-up comment. Um. Uh, well, uh, about what you were talking about, these uh, past weeks, the UN uh, launched this uh, campaign of, of to like support the the people in Syria and everything, but do you think that the campaigns that like how do the people feel them like when they come from the outward? Actually, these campaigns are like thrown to make feel like this not the Syrian society but of the worldwide society feel like the UN is doing something, or these or these uh, campaigns actually help for the to the people of Syria like. What does this have? What's the approach of these types of campaigns? 
Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I, I, I'm the first person to tell you that the UN can be an utter waste of time, uh, a great deal of the time. Um, and your question is half cynical and half optimistic. <laughs> uh, yes, they can be extremely, um, uh, they can be a waste of time. But at the same time, they can be very helpful. So it's a real strange thing. You want to embrace the UN, but you also want to like clean it up and make it more efficient. And I don't know whether these campaigns are what they are exactly. I don't know them. I always hope they're going to be the best. And then I also sometimes find out that they were just, like you say, a, a pony show. Um, it's going to take more than – it's going to take a lot to get Syrians – up and running as uh, to believe that they can overcome these massive forces that are kind of tearing their country apart. Um, so I don't know what the campaigns are, but I, I'm going to, I always, I, I always err on the side of optimism. So um, I'm going to say that I hope that they are campaigns that are coming from a good place and going to do something good. I'm going to hope so. We hope so too. Um, well, thanks a lot. And, uh, just wanted to ask, uh, is there any topic that you're working on right now, a book or, or a film? Um, is there some, something you're well, working on at the moment? Oh, geez. I'm, you know, um, yeah, I wrote a book, which actually is set in Mexico. Oh, really? <laughs> um, so, um, but that's, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Mexico, and I love Mexico. Um, uh but I'm, you know, I'm busy with this teaching thing. I'm in the middle of a screenplay situation, and I'm uh, trying to dream up another new nonfiction book. Because I la my last book about copper mining um, was fascinating to me, which also involved Mexico, up up in the northern region like Cananea. Uh, so I'm, I don't know. I'm always busy. Um, I'm always being pulled to do this or that, and um, which is a good place to be in life, you know. I don't know where your folks are there in terms of what they want to do, but I, I was there, you know, I, I was in college and I did economics and political science and ended up spending 20 years doing things and being paid for and flying around the world. And it's like been a weird dream that I never would have dreamed of how to do. I just did it, did it. I had no, nobody, I had no backing if you want to call it that. Um, it just kind of had its own energy. And, and I guess that was my last last question was, uh, you know, in my classes I tend to be passionate about the truth and, and following it where, wherever it leads. And, well, if you just finish that thought, what words of wisdom do you have for these young people who want to change the world for the better? You know, some might enter politics, um, journalists, work in NGOs, international intergovernmental organizations. Well, what words of wisdom um, final thought what, what would you have for that <laughs> <laughs> well my, my thing is always you know um, I believe in all of that I believe that uh, you know I spent a lot of my time in, I've done a lot of humanitarian work I've done a lot of all the other stuff and it all makes a difference and you, you know the thing is, is you never know how it's making a difference you just do not know so as long as you're doing it for reasons you believe in it's probably working, whether it's in politics, journalism, humanitarian aid business, working locally to help nationally or lo you know internationally. Fine, um, you know it reminds me of that. Who was it? It was the Nobel Peace Prize winner, an African woman, who told the story. Have you ever heard this about the hummingbird? No. Okay, it's really great. This I mean, the story is, I believe, it's a Japanese uh, old story where there's a forest fire. And all, um, there's a forest fire and all the animals in the forest um, are, are running. They're running out of the forest because it's terrible. They're, it's burning all the animals and the homes and they're fleeing the forest. And while they're fleeing the forest, they notice one hummingbird who keeps coming into the forest fire and back out. They keep coming back into the forest fire and back out. And all the animals leave the forest. And hummingbird is, just keeps doing it. And finally, someone asks the hummingbird, what are you doing? And the hummingbird says, I'm putting, I'm bringing water from a stream 
and I'm taking it to the forest farm. And they say, well, that's useless. You're a hummingbird. You can only do like two drops at a time. And the hummingbird says, yes, but it's two drops. It's my way of helping. So you never quite know the power of, uh, let's take, you know me, I was one guy, back, back 200 hours, walked into Bosnia. Somehow I got a hold of the biggest band in the world at the time and had been made a movie and did all this stuff. That's unusual. And it happened because I believed in it. So if you believe in what you're doing, it's extremely powerful. It really is. It's really powerful. Okay. Well, well, thanks a lot. We need uh, good words of wisdom, you know, being here in Mexico. And uh, here's the rest of the class. Thanks a lot again for taking the time out uh, to talk to us here in Mexico. Oh, you bet. Thank you so much, guys. I hope it goes well. And uh, I love Mexico. I just wish it was in a better situation right now. Well, next next time you're in Guadalajara, send us a line, and uh, we'll buy you lunch or something. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, all the best uh, on the rest of your work. Okay, you guys too. Ciao. Bye. Bye.